I don't even got the background details. Who am I? You sure you want that TMZ headline? Gypsy Rose won't meet Taylor Swift at Chiefs game. Booted from state. What? What does that mean? Gypsy Rose Blanchard. No T Swift Chief Meetup Parole Officer says she must leave state. Okay. I see something. Uh... I don't know why she'd be. I don't know why the Swifties want her at the Chiefs game. Game? Is she is she a Chiefs fan or a Swifty fan? I have no clue. All I know is the internet's getting real weird with Gypsy Rose here. So it seems like everybody knows who this person is except for me. Tell me finally about free. Fun fact: Gypsy Rose's husband was actually my history teacher in high school before getting fired. He got fired when the board found out about Gypsy. Oh, really? Well, that's interesting. Like an anecdotal story about himself. I guess he's just. Is he a good teacher? He's a membership, Aaron. I don't know anything about her husband. She's moving to your hometown. Nice. They did, and now Gypsy Rose is out. Oh my god, Adrian. Murder. Uh, her boyfriend was... Her boyfriend suffers from a mental disability. He never had his attorney present when the cops manipulated him into like this full confession that got him life the whole situation's fucked i've talked about this quite a bit so his name is nicholas he's in jail for life she's out and sh now she's married to a different guy N nicholas really got the worst end of this bargain thoughts on taylor swift being in twilight instead of bella huh Right, no way, I don't, I don't care about that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna watch this one. Maybe this one tells the full story about what happened. Because I'm totally like, yo, what the hell is going on? Oh, Joey King played her in the act? In the show or movie? In the show? Call that, okay. Shout out, Joey. Increasingly bizarre. It turns out Gypsy Blanchard and her mother were in the news before. When she was just small. So where are you going today? I'm going to kill the machine to assist her breathing, but this would be nothing compared to. 
being tested for sleep apnea. This would lead to her being forced to sleep with the machine to assist her breathing. But this would be nothing compared to the very painful and confusing childhood that lied ahead of her. Three months old, Dee Dee was telling me that she had uh, sleep apnea and she needed a, a breathing. Dee Dee was telling me that she had uh, sleep apnea and she needed a, a breathing uh, machine or, or a breathing monitor machine. For the kid, it escalated for her, so. Problems with her eyes, hearing, her digestive system. Gypsy's father and mother divorced each other while she was still very young. Her mother would begin moving further and further away from her father after the split. Due to this, Dee Dee slowly became Gypsy's sole care provider and took on the full responsibilities of handling her medical needs. This became especially hard after their home was destroyed in Hurricane Katrina. This is just a glimpse of what life looked like just a few years ago. A family devastated by Hurricane Katrina. She blindfolded me, but I looked and I still have nightmares of what I saw. Due to the issues that they had faced medically and financially, after the hurricane, their community and Habitat for Humanity came together and gifted them a house with other essentials. Those who came together to give them this house felt that Dee Dee had... Yeah, that was like... That's crazy. That was a day after my birthday. That's crazy. Earned it after going through so much and being such a loving and caring mother for her sick daughter. But that's only because none of them knew what was actually happening behind closed doors in the very same house. This is no ordinary house. Now, living with disabilities has never felt better. We have an awesome bathtub. It's a um, jacuzzi tub meant for my muscles. And we have a wonderful ramp so I can get up and down by myself. The light switches. Just, I know she's a kid in that thing. Baby, take away from the areas, but it sounds weird saying it. But she looks like a cute kid, you know, like an innocent, pure, happy kid, you know. I feel like all right, the, the little that I did hear about, I think she killed her mother. I might be wrong, but that's what I think happened. And, and, and leading up to everything, uh. She seems so innocent and pure here, so it feels like it'd be stunning to hear what actually happened to lead up to what ended up happening. I can reach them now. I have wider doors so my chair can get through. All made possible by loving volunteers, hundreds of them, and also with help from Cox, St. John's, and the Center for Independent Living. For the first time, Gypsy says she feels more independent than ever before. It just proves that happy endings are not just in fairy tales. They're real and true in real life also. According to DD, the doctor said that Gypsy had a chromosome disorder that was causing issues with her development. They believe this was the root cause of most of her disabilities. But when Gypsy was in her early teen years, they would visit a pediatric neurologist who began questioning what he was reading in the notes of her medical history. And once he had an opportunity to meet and examine Gypsy for himself, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. This is what he had to say in his notes. Now, this was the first one that jumped out at me. She ends up going to the neurologist, Dr. Flasterstein. And so, very first thing right off the bat, mother is not a good historian. person that has not walked for nine years, for years, she should have technically almost no muscles in her lower extremities. But she didn't have muscles that looked, looked quite normal. And she was able to support her body weight. I remember her. So she could walk, right? Well, the kid would be in on it, right? Unless the mother's like, hey, you have to pretend. Like, uh, I don't know. Standing. So I had a big doubt about the whole thing from the beginning. Well, here's the interesting thing. Yeah, that's true. So I had a big doubt about the whole thing. Able to support her body weight. I remember her standing. So I had a big okay. doubt about the whole thing from the beginning. Well, here's the interesting thing. This is the last record from Mercy here in Springfield until 2015. So this is 2007. Eight years. What I couldn't figure out was how Dee Dee figured out that Dr. Flasterstein was on to her. But if you look at a lot of these social work notes, Dee Dee's requesting medical records. She would have gotten a copy of this letter. This was the closest opportunity Gypsy had to escaping her mother, who we now know was faking her illnesses and over-medicating her for years in order to maintain control over her life and garner sympathy from their community. This form of abuse started when Gypsy was a newborn infant, and Dee Dee was able to keep it going for nearly two decades. Gypsy was forced to endure countless medical procedures, and was force-fed medication and possibly more through her feeding tubes while sleeping. It is now believed that almost all of Gypsy's symptoms and complications were either completely fabricated or caused by over-medicating for issues that she never had in the first place. But I still don't understand why you put your child through. Yeah, I mean, why would you do that to your child? Like, that's weird. I don't know, that seemed like there's something wrong with the mother. 
Because you get a child. The child is just born and you start putting all these things to it. To the child. And then it grows up and you're still doing this. I don't know. I feel like a, as a parent, your job is to take care of your child. Protect your child. Nurture your child. I don't know. I guess. I don't know. I mean, the thing is, I mean, it just keeps going. I mean. And it would have kept going because her mama was an insane, compulsive liar. Edie told me she, she's, she's not going to live to be, you know, 18 years old. She, she may be an old, an old teenager. That's, that's about it. Trying to say she has cancer. She's 23 years old now, perfectly healthy. It's just, it, it pisses me off, you know. What illnesses did your mom say that you had? Um, asthma. The, according to the clothing, it looked like she's already. Epilepsy. Um, hearing impaired, vision impaired. Um, fed with a feeding tube, paralyzed from the waist down, um, slow, so... Um, like, e even at this point, she still seems like a, a nice little girl. Like, like when I'm looking at the facial features... Retardation. And among other things, I just can't remember them. Gypsy's mother had no issue with putting her daughter through tremendous amounts of pain in order to continue... But how would how would it take for that doctor to see it? Like it should be like every doctor should be like. She knew her false narrative of being the loving mother with a sick <sighs> daughter. Gypsy was forced to take a cocktail of medications that were sometimes designed to make her more ill. With every fake illness came a new and painful treatment that were almost always not needed. Many of the treatments Gypsy was forced to endure were incredibly painful. Without a need for them, I feel that it's fair to compare them to torturous acts. The, the fact that, that she's still alive to this day is crazy. Be having my feeding tube put in. You have to have it constantly changed, like every six months. And that would be pretty painful because they don't put you under anesthesia. They just take you in the emergency room, rip the old one out, and put a new one in. As we all Wait, know, making what? even a slight... Like every six months. And that would be pretty painful because they don't put you under anesthesia. They just take you in the emergency room, rip the old one out, and put a new one in. As we all know, making even the slightest changes in your medic. Oh, ooh, wee, the heebie jeebies. That's that's crazy. That that's really crazy though. Like that's crazy. Patient can lead to hundreds of possible side effects. Due to Dee Dee recklessly forcing Gypsy to take medications that were not needed, she began having very real issues that caused her to seek even further treatment. Diagnosed with epilepsy about this time as well, right? Yes, sir. And so they started giving you Tegretol. Mm-hmm. And it caused your teeth to crumble. Yes, sir. Did you know what was happening at the time? No, I really didn't. I just didn't understand why my teeth were falling out. I had to have them extracted. I just knew I was losing teeth. She would learn the hard way that her mother never had her best interest in mind. Gypsy was told from the time that she was a small child that she had developmental problems mentally and physically. As you can imagine, this kind of psychological manipulation could easily cause real issues with a child's mental development. But even with absolute control over everything she heard and saw, Dee Dee could only keep young Gypsy in the dark about her health for so long. As she aged and gained more knowledge of the outside world, she began to question the reality that her mother had laid out for her. She always knew that her mother would exaggerate her physical disabilities, but she had no idea how far she was actually taking the lie. Pretty soon, I found a couple of bits of paper in my mom's safe, things that stated that I was born in 1991, made me question my real age. I asked her about it. She said that it was a typo. I had taken those papers and the Medicaid... Obviously, because that's how she looks. <laughs> She's an older woman at this point. She I don't know if she got her teeth back or they, <laughs> they put something in there. A card that I found with my actual real birthday on it, and I ran away from home. I didn't get very far because she found me pretty quickly and took me back home. Boy, was I in a lot of trouble. What happened when you got home? She smashed my laptop. How did she smash it? It was a hammer. 
And she told me if I was to contact anybody, any of her friends, and tell them that she would take a hammer to my fingers next time. Wait, hold up. Didn't get very far because she. She made me question my real age. I asked her about it. She said that it was a typo. I had taken those papers and the Medicaid card that I found with my actual real birthday on it, and I ran away from home. I didn't get very far because she found me pretty quickly and took me back home. Boy, was I in a lot of trouble. What happened when you got home? She smashed my laptop. How did she smash it? It was a hammer. And she told me if I was to contact anybody, any of her friends, and This is crazy because it really, like, even this image of the mother right here, she looks so evil. <laughs> Yo, it's wicked, bro. Tell them that she would take a hammer to my fingers next time. And then she put a bell on the door. So if I tried to run away again, she could hear it. And she had taken handcuffs and a dog leash and tied it together and tied me to the bed. Tied me to the bed. So how long were you tied to the bed? About two weeks. She basically, she's basically hostage this is wicked bro i just don't understand how somebody can do this to their child their child that they're supposed to protect and love not use them as a cash cow and use them for their own means do you think she loved you when i was younger i thought Wait. that and then just when i found out the truth not use them as a cash cow and use them for their own means. Do you think she loved you? When I was younger, I thought that. And then when I found out the truth, I'm like, I didn't know this woman at all, did I? Everything that she ever told me was a lie. So how can I honestly believe her whenever she told me she loved me? Up to this point of realization, Gypsy had lived her entire life believing that she had mental disabilities. And because of this and the encouragement from her mother, she would typically act younger than the age she was. Once she reached the age of young adulthood, she began realizing that her disabilities had been exaggerated. She became very confused about who she was and what she really wanted. I liked the Disney movie Tangled. It's about Rapunzel. She's a princess of this kingdom, and she's kidnapped by Mother Gothel um, from her real family. And yeah. Mother Gothel keeps her in this tower for all of her life and tells her, don't leave this tower. And so that is all she knows. At the end, Mother Gothel died. She got thrown out a window um, because Rapunzel tried to stand up for herself and leave her tower. But in Disney movies, that becomes a fantasy. It's a fairy tale. And life is not a fairy tale. But I didn't really look at it like it's a psychopathic thing and uh... I'm looking at her, so like, you're almost a psychopath. That's how that seems right there, you know. Fairy tale. I learned all that the hard way. After this escape attempt, Didi would become even more controlling than she was before. Her fear of Gypsy becoming too much to control was finally coming true, and this terrified her. She knew that all it would take is one conversation to the wrong person to cause her entire house of cards to come falling down. So she began taking extra steps to prevent this from happening. My mom had actually convinced a lawyer to draw up some papers saying that I was incompetent. So I thought if I had tried to go to the police, they'd look at these papers and say, she's, you know, she's retarded. She doesn't know what she's talking about. This would cause Gypsy to feel more trapped than ever. She felt like she was a prisoner in her own home. And no matter how hard she tried, she just couldn't find any relief from the constant mistreatment she was enduring. That is, until she met Nick. As she began reaching the age of young womanhood, Gypsy's repressed feelings about relationships would start to come back up. Once Didi gave her access to the internet again, she decided to explore this side of herself and signed up for an online Christian dating website. This is where she would meet Nicholas Godijohn. While the conversation started as lighthearted flirting, after some time they began to become more intimate. Nick would begin sharing his BDSM related fantasies with Gypsy, and in return she would lean into this new world that she had been shut out of for so long. The two would create a secret Facebook account to share their fantasies without Gypsy's mother discovering them. During this part of their relationship, Nick would reveal that he had multiple personalities, and that one of them, in his words, was an evil vampire named Victor. He would then explain that he wanted Gypsy. Okay, 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 okay. But anyway.
be have a beer. Mm-hmm. That is her name. Mm. Anyway. Uh, she did develop another personality to become uh, Victor's girlfriend. So she obliged. Candy. After a while of sharing photos and messaging online, the two finally decided to meet in person. The only problem is that if Dee Dee discovered the relationship, she would most likely put an end to it. So instead they came up with a plan to make it seem as if though they were meeting naturally for the first time in public. We had planned a meeting at the movie theater. I and my mom was going to go see Cinderella, the live action version of Cinderella. And I was like, this is a perfect time for us to meet. I'll buy your ticket, and you come to the movie theater, and we'll meet. Like, we're just meeting as new friends, and it's going to be perfect. Nick claims that during this meeting, the two of them would sneak off to the bathroom where they would have sex in the men's room for the first time. After this, they would go into the theater and watch the movie with Gypsy's mother. She despised him. She was like, he's creepy, he's weird, he's coming to see a kid's movie alone by himself. And now looking back on it, yeah, it is weird. <laughs> we were the only people in the movies, and he didn't have a kid with him or a girlfriend. Or nothing. He's just this guy going to see this chick movie. <laughs> this meeting going poorly with Dee Dee would be the final blow that destroyed Gypsy's hope of escaping from her mother. After a year of secretly dating, Gypsy would tell Nick everything that had been happening behind closed doors in her home. From here, they decided enough was enough, and Nick felt that it was time to save the love of his life. So he boarded a bus and rode to Gypsy's home. I know that you all have most of the information uh, related to the PC statement, so I'm going to start going into some facts uh, that we have, and then I'll take questions. Both Facebook postings uh, that appeared uh, and that everyone has copies of were authored by Gypsy. As we dig into this further, we'll have more information uh, regarding the details. I want to make a statement to use caution in donating money to this family at this time, as we have unearthed the appearance of a long financial fraud scheme along with this tragic event. And um, I want to give you the opportunity to start over and tell the truth, okay? And the truth is, is not what you've told me. I believe the part that you got on a bus and went to Springfield. Okay. I believe that's true. Okay. Um, that you ordered food to eat. I believe that's true. Okay. Um, I believe that it's true that at some point Gypsy came back to with you to the motel. I believe yeah. that's true. Yeah. I believe Gypsy got on a bus and came here with you. I believe yeah. that's true. Yeah. That's all I believe. Okay. Because okay? you missed a lot in there. And I understand that you missed a lot because you're probably, you don't know what to say because you don't know what Gypsy said. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you right now, Gypsy did tell me everything. She told us everything. And, um, he, he came inside. And, um, he, he started walking to, um, to my mom's room. And I told him that he needed to go outside. He needed to go outside. Um, Why did this happen to your mom? What was the reason for it? I don't know. All I know is that yeah, that's why did he hurt her? What was his reason behind this? We'll go back to that why. I can't say why. He knows I love my mom. He knows that that she's the most important thing to me. So what I want to know is, is um, can you tell me this first? Did Gypsy know that you were going to kill her mother? Um, honestly, she asked me to. Okay, so, so Gypsy Wait. knew you were going to do it because Gypsy asked Wait, so he's saying that Gypsy asked her, and it sounds like she's saying she, she was oblivious to this whole thing, and why would she do that? She, she loved her mother or whatever the situation is. Two different stories. Why did she ask you to do that? And I talked to Nick. He had me talk to Victor, who initially was the one that was going to do the murder. And he was like,
quite a while ago. Yeah, I got so you went to the punisher if you let him in, gave him duct tape. With the understanding that he would use it to murder. Well, they had a conversation and they, they there was a little conspiracy thing going on. And the basement covered her ears so that she would not. And cats that DD had bills, mostly from Rod's child support checks. They fled outside of Springfield, where they stayed for a few days while planning their next move. What? They mailed it back to the house? I understand she is kind of like a naive person, like not knowledgeable, like a lot of things, but... Left up here on there and noted that Gypsy wore a blonde wig and walked unassisted. So she can walk. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't I don't know. I don't know what the true story is, you know, everybody got that so, you know, whatever court has wins up. Ask Victor. Please. And Victor 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 Come kill my mother for me because I can't do it myself. And so after that, he took his bus, Greyhound bus, from Wisconsin to Missouri. So she he did stayed that. at the local hotel. I texted him when my mother went to sleep. I let him in the door. There were gloves waiting for him, plastic gloves, by the door. You put them there? I put them there. He came in and he was wearing a hoodie and dark clothing and a scary t shirt that had evil clowns on it. And I handed him the knife, and he said, get your ass in the bathroom now. And I went in the bathroom, closed the door behind me, and kind of got down in a kneeling position and put my hands over my ears so I couldn't hear anything. But I did hear stuff. I heard her scream for me a couple times. But at first, like, she, she sounded like she was startled, like, who's there? And then I heard her screaming. With one hand, or do you take two hands to hold the knife? One hand. One hand? Yes. Okay. Have you ever stabbed anybody before this? No. That's the reason why uh, this was the very only one person I'd ever do this for. Okay. Only person you do it for is Gypsy. This is the first time you ever stabbed anybody. Yes. Where's the first place you decided to stab her? In the... Uh, I just was in the random spot in the back. In the back, just random? Yes. Do you know how many times you stabbed her? Uh, four. You stabbed her four? Yeah, four times. Did she scream or holler or... Yeah, she scream too. What was she saying? Uh... First she said help, and then she didn't know, she didn't recognize who I was, so she okay. said, who are you, and then... She said, who are you? Yeah. Okay. And she didn't recognize who you are, and she says help, and then what did she say? And then she called up for Gypsy, but she didn't do anything. Okay. She hollered for Gypsy? Yes. Did she holler for Gypsy once, twice, five times? After their plans to introduce <laughs> Nick to DD at the theater went poorly, the two felt that they only had one option left. So Gypsy asked Nick if he would be willing to kill her mother, so they could run away and live their life together. And that's exactly what he did, in a brutal fashion. After the this murder, is... the two... This is spooky, bro. This is spooky. This is spooky. When, when I was in the Epstein thing, I was trying to count on a video like this type of situation. Fled from the house and got a pair of Wait. bus tickets to Nick's hometown of Big Bend, Wisconsin, where they would stay with his parents for a few days before they were finally caught and arrested. After being arrested, police would discover that Nick had mailed the murder weapon back to his house and was still in possession of the blood-soaked clothes from the night of the killing. From here, they would both be put on trial for the murder of Daniel Blanchard. In 2015, Nick was convicted of first-degree murder. He will spend the rest of his life in prison. Gypsy pleaded guilty to second degree murder for her part in planning the murder of her mother. She was sentenced to 10 years in prison, with a chance at parole in 2023. While in prison, Gypsy became engaged with a man she met through the prison pen pal system. That's crazy. Wait, what? System. They have parole in 2023. While in prison, Gypsy became engaged with a man she met through the prison pen pal system. They have since broken off the engagement. When asked about this, Nicholas said that he felt like Gypsy has abandoned him. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's crazy because. I understand you murdered somebody. She was like the savior, if you think about it, if his story sense. He saved her, right? He murdered someone, but he did it to save someone. But it's still murder, so... You know what I mean? Like, 
does he deserve to be for the rest of his life in jail? I mean, be in prison for the rest of his life? That, that's crazy, you know. But however you feel like she parole, right? And then she's released on parole, I imagine, right? The crazy thing is she ended up talking with another dude and being with that person. It's like whatever, I don't know. Damn, I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted, bro. Thanks for watching, and stay safe. Stay safe. Yeah, this is a wicked story. It's like, wicked in a bad way. This is a scary, fucked up. We helped millions of creators improve their SEO to grow their YouTube channels. TubeBuddy is a platform that. This is the other side of Kirk Franklin. Through this shit, but uh, I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna let brain. <laughs> <laughs> this is the record. 2024. <laughs> all my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. One slice, got to roll the dice, that's why All my life, I've been grinding all my life, yeah. All my life, been grinding all my life Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price One slice, got to roll the dice, that's why All my life, I've been grinding all my life Hello, welcome to another episode of Club Shay Shay. I am your host, Shannon Sharp. I'm also the proprietor of Club Shay Shay, the guy that's stopping by for conversation and the drink today. Ladies and gentlemen, you're gonna love him. Some call him the greatest, the greatest, one of the greatest comedians, dead or alive. One of America's greatest entertainers, one of the funniest men on the planet, world-renowned, multi-talented, a comedy legend. He's touring. To, he's the top touring comedian selling out arenas. He's a hilarious storyteller, Emmy award-winning actor, voice actor, rapper, writer, producer, director, icon, genius, a national tre treasure, philanthropist, humanitarian, social activist, a father, one of the great funny men of our generation and any generation, Mr. Cat Williams. Thank you, sir. Uh, How's that, that magnificent? Uh, you are. You are. You are magnificent at intros, and you did not skimp on mine. I appreciate it. Appreciate that. Fair you know, anytime you come to Club Shay Shay, we have to toast. Yes. Bro, you've been doing it. I mean, you told you one of the top two. You're the one of the top touring comedians of all time. You already got started before we started taping. Mm. I did. Appreciate that. Tell the people at home. I thought they was lying, and um, <laughs> yeah, this particular alcohol is stronger than you think it would be probably by about two and unbelievably smoother and milder by the same maybe 30 percent than you could possibly expect and unlike cognacs the world over this one doesn't taste like wood at the end and it doesn't taste like it's got artificial colors and it doesn't taste like it's got artificial flavors uh it's a it's a fine product he's a console you can tell He's a, he's a cognac connoisseur. He understands the method that goes into making cognac. Right. Well, as a comedian, you get free drinks at the club. <laughs> so all comedians either turn out to be connoisseurs like myself right. or straight up and down alcoholics like 60% of Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks for stopping by the club. I understand Thank that you're you very, very busy. And for you to take time out of your busy schedule and stop in today, we really, really appreciate it here at Club Shay Shay. Thank so thanks for so stopping much. by, Kat. And I needed you to know why I came by. Yeah, I need you to tell us why. People know I don't go everywhere. I'm not interested in talking to people unless it's like a Larry King or somebody of an amazing ilk that I would actually want to go talk to in real life. OK. Um, I don't do it so I can sell product and I got things to sell. So let me come talk. Um, you have a great product here and as a fan base we love the attention that you spend on the guests we, we love how much work you've done how well you know them how prepared you are the same things that we liked about you in football <laughs> you brought that on over to here and that's uh, why it resonates and the reason i had to come is because you've made a safe place for the truth to be told you know what i mean Thank you. I appreciate and that. i have watched all of these low-brow comedians come here and disrespect you in your face <laughs> and tell you straight up lies. I'm talking about things that have never been heard in all of black Hollywood. They feel comfortable sitting here lying to you about it. You gonna say the record straight? Are you kidding me? You let Ricky Smiley sit here and you said out that mouth, you stole Friday after next, the one I was in? <laughs> I wish all, all of America fumbled a bit 
when that happened. And, and then he said some stuff that we haven't heard in 100 years in Hollywood. You ain't say nothing. But this man told you he had Cat Williams' role. He was going to be Money Mike. Wait. And Cat Williams was going to be fr was going to be the Santa Claus. Now, let's three quick points. Three quick. You mean in Hollywood, they cast a five foot five black Santa Claus that weigh 145 pounds. That's your story. Your story is the Ricky Smiley that couldn't even do curse words because he had a Christian fan base. He was going to play the pimp. Why you didn't ask him why has he played a woman in more movies than he's played a man? Well, I didn't know he, he shouldn't be able. You wouldn't let a, 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 a athlete that been on steroids talk about one of the greats. <laughs> Ricky Smiley can't act because Ricky Smiley can't act. He told you the story about when the movie came out. Where did he say he watched it? At home. He wasn't even at the premiere. You telling this man you stole that. Oh, so he could get his name in the same sentence. With a great one. It is sad. He was just that bitter when we were shooting it. He told everybody, it should have been my role. Everybody on the scene. Why do you think no cast member has ever said anything? He could have played that role like you. I thought he, he Sir, was... Sir, no one... Why no... He was with KD? He beat up Terry Crews? Why nobody know this story? You talking about in Hollywood, they switched off roles. You take this and he... What? So Ricky, Ricky Smiley knows this, and I don't know why he would lose a child and come on the air and start lying. That's why people believe in rituals right there. It's because, well, why would he lie? I don't know why liars lie, but I can tell you this. We auditioned in Los Angeles. Yes. I was audition number 201. 200 black comedians auditioned for the role of Money Mike with me. You're saying all 201 of us was auditioning And you had already had the role and had already shot the role in four days. The truth of the matter is the money Mike in the original script got raped in the bathroom. And that's what Ricky Smiley was OK with. Cat Williams had to take the risk in front of the studios and the cast and our powers that be in his. First movie and say respectfully, humbly, guys, if we talk about anything else, I have no credibility and I have no pull. But we're talking about comedy, right. where I have all the credibility and all the pull. The problem with Friday After Next is we're trying to make a classic comedy. And this comedy involves a rape. And rape is never funny, no matter who it happens to or what the circumstances are. If you would allow me to allow us to do this movie without a black man getting raped in it, I promise you that it will be twice as funny as it would be with him getting raped. So considering that's the real story, why would you bring up that story? 35 members of the cast and crew have never brought up that Ricky Smiley was going to play Money Mike. No one ever saw me put on a Santa Claus suit. We got a wardrobe department. They made a Santa Claus suit for me. Why that wasn't in the bloopers? Why? And, and here's the other thing. Everything that Money Mike said, Cat Williams wrote. So what Ricky Smiley say on his? You can't say my lines. I wrote them. That's how I already know that I'm going to be funnier than you. What he told everybody was, Cat Williams, hey, hey, don't nobody know who he is? I'm on the radio. I'm with Steven Said. Everybody know me. That's what he told everybody that would listen to on the set. That's the truth of the matter. He was so egregious. Not now. Then he was so egregious that and Hollywood has never heard this in 100 years. He was so egregious. I put in my contract that I won't work with Ricky Smiley again unless he's in a dress. Now, what was Ricky Smiley's next movie? Was it First Sunday? Did he wear a dress in it? You bet he did. It's in my contract. Why would you put that in your, put this in your contract, Cat? That's where he's the, a believable actor. Him and Tyler Perry can't play a man to save their life. They play good women. And I believe that the best actor should be in the best role. So that's why, because when we released that clip and he said that, you responded because he said he was supposed to play Money Mike and you were supposed to play, play Santa Claus. An outright lie. So, that he knows is a lie. So why would he say it? Because he's a liar. Nobody knows why liars lie. And that's why I had to come on the program. Cedric did the same thing. Cedric told you when you asked him, did you steal Cat Williams joke? Yeah. He said it don't line up. How it don't line up that I did it on TV in 2018. You came to see me at the comedy store, do it in 2019 and then did it on the Kings of Comedy. Like what doesn't line up? I, this is a televised joke that Mark Curry helped me punch up and get to the level that it was. The same Steve that went to go watch Mark Curry do his whole sitcom and then stole every thing Mark Curry had. Now Steve got a sitcom where he the principal and he wear a suit and he and then he gets this high top fade making all black men think he got the best lineup in the business and it's a man unit. 
Then you ask it, why you not a movie star? I didn't want to be a movie star. This the same Negro that hated on Bernie with this same thing. I didn't want to be a movie star. No, you couldn't be a movie star. There are 30,000 new scripts in Hollywood every year. Not one of them asked for a country bumpkin black dude that can't talk good or became and look like Mr. Potato Head. There ain't none. You would have to have range. I played a lot of characters, 60 movie roles. I'm not playing Cat Williams in there. I don't know, I don't know, Cat. We might not let you drink anymore the way you, you, I mean, we ain't even got- I'm not fueled by alcohol. I've had a sip, less than you. It's Brett. I'm Isabel. Yeah, I know. I want to be in the story. Or maybe Charleston White is like him. The truth don't need motivation. I'm just saying I can't let these dudes lie. Cedric sitting here telling you why he ain't a movie star. He over here look like a walrus. You didn't say nothing. He can't even get his arms off his stomach sitting over here. Why I'm not a movie star. What? It's a situation. We never wrote anything. Remember, when Cedric the Entertainer starts, he's supposed to be singing, dancing, and telling jokes. That's why he's called the Entertainer. Right. We found out he can't sing, can't dance, and doesn't he's write jokes. He did four comedy specials. They're so bad, Shannon. They're not available on Netflix or Tubi. Can I say that again for the audience? They're so bad that they're not available on Netflix or Tubi. You don't think Sam's a good, a good comedian? The world doesn't think that, sir. I have 12 comedy specials. He has four specials that are not available on Netflix or Tubi. It seems to me, Kat, that you had a lot to get off your chest. No, no. You wanted to say I the record straight. Winners are not allowed to allow losers to rewrite history. I don't say any of these things if my name is not breached by these people on your platform. They, if you give a liar a platform to lie, then I, I'm not being messy by saying, hold on, that never happened. It's untrue. And there are hundreds of witnesses for each thing I'm saying. So let me ask you this. What is your relationship with Steve Harvey, Ricky Smiley, and Cedric the Entertainer as you sit here currently? They, for 30 years, they're a group. These aren't three random guys. The way that Ricky Smiley kept appearing at all of my auditions is because of Steve and said he would tell anybody that, listen, they got a gang on that side. They know what it is. They know who the gang is. Why Earthquake not in movies? Because he's illiterate. He can't read. And they found that out when they gave him a show and put the cards in front of him. Like all of these dudes are co-entwined and they share secrets. And this is the age of truth. And, and, and the truth doesn't need to be scared of the fact that people tell lies. Uh, cats on drugs. Where are the stories? Why is there no story of anybody who ever sold a drug to me, did a drug with me, was around me when I was inebriated? I got five daughters. I got five sons. Why would we tell these ridiculous stories? Because it's com competition. You you feel like, well, why comedy, comedy guys can't just get along? Yes. Why, why, why didn't you get along with the other teams you were competing against? If you're a Denver Bronco, why you don't get along with the Cowboys? Something wrong with you? But I don't disagree. I don't no, dislike no, all no. the Cowboys. Cat, damn, you like this. No, like that's okay, not. What comedians do you did like? Did you play against the team? Yes. I've taken 46 comedians with me on the road. 46. Okay. I'm not the comedian you can give that to. I only put on comedians that are funnier than me. Anybody that ever told you differently was a fat Faison liar. There's nobody yeah, like you, me in the business. Faison just on straight. Faison said that getting a Netflix special is easy. I have 12 specials. Guess how many Faison got? Zero. So Why is he allowed to have conversations about real stand-up people? We do not let people who are on the juice discuss real athletes. That's all. As a journalist, that's all. That's all I'm saying. Okay. I don't have, harbor any resentment to any of these entities because I can't be jealous. I've never seen them have anything that I ever wanted. If you sign up for their program, you get a light skin, Weird face wife that never do an interview. Oh, in man, come on. Listen, in 20 years, won't do an interview. Nobody's ever talked to her and that she's never been interviewed anywhere. And now understand, I'm not talking about one person. What I just told you applies to seven people. How they all end up with that. That's part of what you get. I came in this business saying I was going to expose. When I talked about Michael Jackson, when I talked about R. Kelly, they canceled me for these things because why would you talk about another black dude? Race is not where the line is drawn. It's God's side and the other side. And we don't care. I'm the other side. That's how it is. Nothing about the other side.
period, period. All of these uh, big de deviants is all catching hell in 2024. It's up for all of them. It don't matter if you Diddy or whoever you is, TG Jakes, any of them, the, every, all lies will be exposed. That's all. And, and, and anyone who takes that the wrong way know why they take it the wrong way. The truth is the light. I didn't have nothing with these. Amen, amen. Gee. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of <clears throat> get on here. All right. After that, I don't really kind of know where to go. Let me one more time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. We good now? Because the people want to know, well, why would he get blackballed? Yeah, oh, because, I'm going because, that. because in 30 years, I've done nothing but collect information, knowledge, and your secrets. So if you and a man was in a corner doing something you wasn't supposed to be doing. You will tell it. No, somebody come to tell me. Okay. I gather that. I value that. I'll pay for that. Come, tell me. I know so many things I shouldn't know, and they all know it. They all know it. Why? Because you don't make me the villain. Not the guy that raises black children and ain't never done a hard drug in his life and don't have no stories of doing nobody dirty. And they'll just go out and they'll lie. The, the industry doesn't mess with Cat because he didn't show up for the studio. No studios have ever said that. Look at my IMDb. It will show you that no studio has ever lost money with me on the script. How? That's why I'm saying that's why I can't let Ricky Smiley say he was supposed to play Money Mike because I wrote the words for Money Mike. I designed the hair for Money Mike. I collaborated with the wardrobe department and made outfits to make sure that no one in America would be wearing what Money Mike was wearing. I told him to go get the prowler. I then told him to paint it purple. I told him don't have an actor at playing a pimp. We could get an actual pimp Archbishop Magic Don Juan to play. Like I, I did far too much work for somebody to come years later and try to tag along just for their own self-aggrandizement. Why didn't Q set the record straight? Terry Crews could have set the record straight. Mike Epps could have set the record straight. Why none of them set the record straight? That's what you were supposed to ask him when he told you those lies that but no I didn't one's know ever heard. Lie. Right, but he's telling you something no one's ever heard of. Nobody has ever heard, oh, Matt Aff Ben Affleck and Matt Damon was in a movie and somebody said, y'all should switch roles. And, like, this is a business. But that's the thing, Kat. <laughs> Normally when people will give you information, I'm thinking I'm hearing it for the first time and they're giving information no one else knows or has ever heard. So I'm taking them at face value. These are like, this is like Steve Harvey telling people he used to be homeless. That's my story. That's not his story. Steve Harvey wasn't never homeless. When he, Mark Curry was touring with him 25. Loses everybody. I don't know if what he's saying is true because he's just saying it and I'm supposed to trust him, I assume. But he just casually just... Talk to us, Steve Harvey, right here. Years ago, he was making $3,000 a show in cash and doing five shows a week. They, they just tell the stories. This, my, thanks to my wife, I'm where I am. You said that about the first wife. You forget that? <laughs> you told us it was her. Then you went and married somebody else that think like a man. Like, what are you talking about? They just, they think they can rewrite history. That uh, uh, Guy Tory did a beautiful special about the comedy store and Fat Tuesday, where he said that Steve and Cedric and Kevin Hart and Tiffany Haddish came through there and made... All lies. Steven Cedric never performed at the comedy store at all. Tiffany was only seen at the Laugh Factory in 15 years in Hollywood. No one in Hollywood has a memory of going to a sold out Kevin Hart show. There being a line for him ever getting a standing ovation at any well, comedy he club. He already had his deals when he got here. Have we heard of a comedian that came to L.A. and in his first year in L.A. he had his own sitcom on network television and had his own movie called Soul Plane that he was leading? No, we've never heard of that before that person or since that person. What do you think a plant is? Maybe people don't understand the definitions of these words. If you're an independent business, get HoneyBook and manage your client. I think that's a major thing to whether Kevin Hart is the industry. He just did his documentary with Chris Rock where he shows you that his whole upbringing in comedy was on the East Coast. Yeah, it was. So how simultaneously was he here in Los Angeles doing the same thing? It didn't happen. It didn't happen. And I, I, I hate to seem like a petty individual for picking apart lies, but Jussie Smollett gonna keep lying until you say we don't believe you. Like it's important in the checks and balances of the universe that liars not get to make complete narratives for themselves. Are you not afraid about being blackballed again? These are some power people. What powerful. do you mean again? These people are not powerful. Satan can't create anything. That includes blessed people. That's why, you know what the number one job of somebody that sold their soul in Hollywood is? What? Is to act like it didn't happen. They all do the same job. 
Why do you think Gary Owen can't cross over and he already white and been in comedy for 25 years? By that logic, anyone who says they're not part of the Illuminati are. But anyone who says they didn't still slowly so are. So that means you. If what I say ain't the case. It's a cabal. It's a it's a consortium. They they rock with who they rock with and they don't with who they don't. But I'm not scared of being the competition any more than you were when you lined up uh, uh, across from a superior team. Yeah, on paper, they're a better team. Right. They have all the assets and resources and we don't. But let us get on the line, boy, boy, and see if that factors in. I, I guarantee you it won't. Wow. Because Shannon Sharp got to be a different person than that other person. Absolutely. And he always was. That doesn't change when I change teams. That remains the same. That's how a legacy is built. So all of these shortcut takers, I, I was, they canceled me for talking about Harvey Weinstein before the thing came out, but he offered to suck my penis in front of all my people at my agency. Really? You want to suck your dick? What am I mm -hmm. supposed to do? He did all of that. I'm thinking I'm the only black person on the script. I get there, there's three other black guys on there. Woo. Huh. So you wonder what they did to <laughs> I told him no. What y'all do? <laughs> <laughs> and this is why when I walk in a room, heads go down. Behind my back, I'm nothing. I'm just a regular old comedian that's bitter and jealous. But in my face, no, no, no. The king has walked in and they have to respect it only because I've not taken the shortcuts. I've not been funded. They pay you to not talk about things they don't want you to talk about. They tell you that themselves. I can't do that because I. Uh, Steve told you that he stopped doing stand up because he has seven TV shows. The only problem is when he stopped stand up, he didn't have those seven TV shows. He stopped stand up because he got in a comedy battle called the Championship of Stand Up Comedy with one Cat Williams in Detroit in front of 10,000 people and lost because Cat Williams said he was actually bald and that was a wig. And I went in and that's why he couldn't do stand up anymore. Imagine him coming to tell you another story where he got so big and it was Bernie and them's fault because they wanted to be movie stars. What? You called Ocean Eleven to get that nigga's part. What do you mean you didn't want to be a movie star? So on the behalf of Bernie, I, I would have to say what I have to say. Have, you ever, been on, have you ever been on tour with any of these guys? The, I, every guy I mentioned to you is not funny out there in real life. So mm -hmm. no. Faison's never done his own tour in 30 years. Steve Harvey don't do stand up no more. Cedric doesn't write. I'm sorry, he doesn't write. Ricky Smiley has been playing the same old black woman forever. Like you can't get a young fan base with that. Like you gotta be doing karaoke around the country to make that work. Right. And he is. But I'm a stand up comedian. This is my 19th 100 city tour. I'm not gonna have a conversation with these lazy bums that'll take a shortcut at any point. Yes, it's easier for you to juice than to get in the gym, but you don't get to bring that body in here talking crazy. Talk about how good you look. What? No, no, there's too many comics out there that are putting their life on the line to tell these jokes, man. Okay, let's get to your upbringing. We're gonna circle back and we'll get some, uh -huh. I wanna protect them real quick. Did you have said for the Kings of Comedy, it was in 2018, 2019, but did you mean 1999? Because it came out in 2000, so I just want to make it. No, I didn't, no, no. So what I meant to say was, remember, he said, I couldn't do stand-up anymore. I had seven TV shows. I said he didn't have any of those TV shows at the time. I know, you're talking about Detroit Cedric. Joke stealer from Cedric. Yeah, Cedric. Oh, okay. So you okay. said that in okay. 2018, 2019, but it came out in 2000, so I just want to make sure. Okay, no, 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 no. What comes out in 2000? The, the original Kings of Comedy. Right. My, I'm on BET's Comic View, and they're using this as the commercial in 1998. Okay. That's why I'm saying, yeah. So if I, yeah. So if I yeah. said the date's wrong, yeah. So yes. let's go ahead and clear that up. Okay. You said, yeah. I had Cedric on here, and I asked him about the joke stealing, and yeah. he said the timeline doesn't add up. Correct. To your, to to that point, you say. Right. So he thought that I was just a no name comedian and that he could take this joke and nobody would know. Right. The issue was that I had already done this particular joke on BET's Comic View twice. Right. It had done so well on BET's Comic View that they had made it part of the commercial. So part of the commercial of make sure you tune in to BET was you seeing me doing this joke. Right. And this joke is one of those jokes in comedy where you set it up and it takes a little longer to set it up, it takes about three minutes, but then you're just hitting them with jokes after right. that because you don't have to set it up. Right. Uh, Mark Curry had already helped me work on this joke because I thought it was good because I was getting a standing ovation on it. He had me go back in the lab and help me craft it to be an even more powerful joke. 
joke. So this is not just a random joke. This is my very best joke, and it's my last joke, and it's my closing joke. Okay. 1998, I'm doing this joke. It's on Comic View. Cedric comes to the comedy store. He watches me in the audience. He comes backstage. He tells me what a great job I did and how much he loves the joke. Two years later, he's doing that as his last joke on the Kings of Comedy. And he's doing it verbatim. He's just changed my car into a spaceship. Him and Steve had already apologized for me, so I gave him a pass for a decade. Why would you sit here and be like, I talked to, I saw Cat 30 times, <laughs> and Cat didn't do, as I stand before you, Shannon, I would have bust Cedric's stomach. <laughs> There was nothing that would have kept me from one of these in, in that patch right there. Like, are you kidding me? Why would you downplay me like that? Why did I give you a pass if you were just going to lie? And so that's what I'm saying. Like, they're all a group. Cedric, Steve, Ricky, they've been a group. Everybody knows that. They've been aligned. And, and there are these alliances in comedy. And if you stand against them, then they sometimes have a problem. But we don't let that change the content because that's all you know me for is that I'm quite likely to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Can you believe we're this deep into the NFL season? We got to make every second count. Your upbringing. Born in Cincinnati, Ohio, raised in Dayton, Ohio. Hmm. What was Cat Williams' upbringing like? Your parents were Jehovah Witness. You were uh, a prodigy. Yeah. Um. If, if you t say that my family is very religious, let just say I'm not. So anything that I, I'm going to do is not is going to fall out of the guidelines. Right. But I'm not going to let you tell me what I'm going to be, even especially if what you're saying is wrong. I can't condone wrong. And if I find out that something is wrong and I tell you it's wrong and you don't back me. That's so, what it is. Even as a young child, you were willing to tell your parents that some of the things that you're saying doesn't coincide with what I've been reading in, in, in the Bible. No, no, very simply. Don't don't try to disfellowship me for sexual acts and I'm a virgin. Sorry, God, don't make mistakes. You don't get two times to fuck me over. What do you mean you went to God and he told you I was guilty? <laughs> you just lied on God. So long. That's it. There's no conversation. Deuces. That's so that, what it was. That's when you made the decision. After yes. that conversation right there, you say, no, I can't, I can't live under this roof. It wasn't a conversation. It was an altercation. In the altercation, I love my father. My father loved me. But we are two men at it. That, it'll never be the same again. You can't sleep comfortably around me. And I can't sleep comfortably around you. How similar are you to your father? No, um, I don't. I don't know. He's a great man. I, I'm, I'm saying. Because uh, he's like y'all butt head, y'all butt heads. Right, but I'm saying that generally happens with a father. Maybe I should have listened to his backstory, you know, because I'm like out of the loop and I'm like, wait, what happened? Father uh, son dynamic. It was just that um, religious relationships are always difficult right. in families. And they always are. Before it got to the point, because the dynamic, he's father, your son. Before that dynamic and you step up on his level and you challenge him, you felt it was best for you to leave. No, no, no. I'm not being challenged. I'm being beat to death. Oh, he was abusive. I didn't say that. I said we were in an altercation. Oh, uh, <laughs> I see what you did there. I saw what you did there. I saw what you did there, Cat. Yeah. I saw what you did. You was in an altercation. You didn't say you lost. You said you was in an altercation. I in no way gave you the impression that I won anything. I'm the one leaving. I'm out of bounds. This is his house. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You so as long as I'm going to be under his roof, you there are certain father. things that I'm going to have to do. Right. And the only way that's going to change is either this or that. Right. And I, I, I'm saying I had two younger brothers. Like, I'm not I'm not an unreasonable person. Like, I don't have any mental issues whatsoever, despite what they lead people to believe. You know, I make good, pretty good decisions. Were you not? Uh, so how was their relationship with your father? Were you not afraid to leave them? Well, I asked because it, it went all the way to the actual department. So it was actually going to be something. Um, and when I asked them if they could just make sure that my brothers didn't get separated and what have you, um, they said they couldn't make those type of guarantees that they weren't really sure what would happen if this went down. And so part of leaving was 
the hope that it would be okay for them because not, none of them experienced what I experienced. I'm saying I'm the oldest. It's a lot riding on me. I'm supposed to at least religiously hold down the family's name Correct. at this household. Correct. You know what I mean? How much older are you than the baby and the knee baby? Like a lot older. Like I, if I'm... I 12, think, 13. I think, yeah, they're five and in Pampers. You hear the, his voice so shaky? Like, it's like he's about to like, cry. You, know, you can tell like, it's something really fucked up. It was really traumatic for him. I don't know, I felt sad for him. Wow. You go to Florida, you tell the story. I've heard you, t you were homeless. And right. somebody else told the story, said they were homeless, and you said they they hijacked your story. Now I don't hey, I don't At 13, I shouldn't have to tell you I'm homeless. I'm in a I'm in Miami, Florida. I have no family members in Florida. I couldn't buy a house if I wanted to. I couldn't get an apartment if I wanted Correct. to. I don't have a credit history. Like this is not a stretch for me to say that I'm homeless. I'm, I'm living in a park in Coconut Grove. The park still exists to this day. Mm -hmm. For eight hours a day, I would get up and go to the library and study for eight hours a day to increase my education. And then I would leave out of there and go to the marina and steal car radios and make $2,000 almost daily. Like I had a routine. This so you really could have played that San old thief in Santa Claus. You could have played it. <laughs> No, the Santa Claus wasn't a thief. The, yeah, he was. the he Santa Claus, you can't tell me. I read the script. Ricky Smiley told you he didn't read the script. The, the Santa Claus was a crackhead. He just had that outfit on. That's what I couldn't have played. Okay. Like, I couldn't have played a black guy that got raped in the bathroom. Right. So at any point in time, you're like, man, I made a mistake, man. I should have stayed my butt in Ohio, man, because this is, man, this ain't what I signed up for. I didn't experience anything once I left home that I hadn't signed up for. If anything, it saved my life. Me being homeless for that small period of time allowed me to see all of the people that were in that situation and to see that these were lawyers and doctors and, 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 and teachers and that these people were white and black and Asian and Indian. And the only thing that all of these homeless people had in, in, in common was um, they made a bad decision and aligned themselves with drugs. And I interviewed them all. What drug? What? And guess what, Shannon? What? Nobody had a great story. Nobody had a great story of what meth had done for them, what crack had done for them, what cocaine had done for them, what heroin had done for them, what speed had done for them. Nobody had them stories. Everybody's story was I had my life together and then I decided to do this dumb thing. And I lost my wife, I lost my house, I lost my cars, I lost my reputation and now I'm now out here sucking penis in the woods. What? Talk about scared straight. You ain't got to worry about me. <laughs> if it ain't weed or nicotine, you won't see me touching it. I don't want no parts. I done seen what these things can do to people. Anything that take over your free will is the devil itself. Have you ever thought about what your life would have been had you stayed in Dayton, Ohio? No, that, that's like asking somebody that's in the NBA for 14 years, like, what would have happened if you didn't come to the NBA? Oh, I shudder to think. I. I I thought it was what I was made for. I thought it was what I was built for. Anybody that knows me will tell you that when they first met Cat Williams, when I was Cat in the Hat, and they tell these stories about how he changed his name. Look, the truth of the matter is Disney sued me. Yeah, I was Cat in the Hat. They sent me a cease and desist letter and I'm not even making $25,000 a year. And the mega company Disney has sent me a cease and desist telling me I can't use any variations of that name. Fine, I'm Cat Williams. That's all that happened. I have been this same product the entire time. They will tell you when they first saw me doing stand up, I was just like this. This is what I bring. This is my style. When did it when did you know you was going you wanted were you always funny? Did you always want to be a comedian? How, did you stumble on a comedian ship? No, I I I loved what they did and so I studied them. All of them. I studied all of the white comedians because I wanted to know why is Monty Python funny? Why is Don not so talented? I wanted to know what is George Carlin's thing? Like where? So I studied all of the comedy masters, regardless of the field, because I loved 
to laugh. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that these people were making a great living at doing this. I thought this is just what they did. They tell jokes. They're funny people. But I loved the craft. And that's why when I got into the craft, I thought it was my obligation to make sure that I kept writing new material so much that it forced these comedians to stop doing the set they've been doing for 10 years and keep writing some new stuff. And I knew that if I could get that to take on, that most of these bums would have to just quit comedy because they can't keep up. They're not going to keep writing an hour worth of material. Right. I've written an hour worth of material 19 times. They're not going to do it. Why? Because they're not creative writers. They want to get somebody else and have them write it and put it together. So, so if I'm listening to you correct, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the best thing that ever happened was the internet. Because now they have to. Because normally, like you said, you could do a set and you do that do that, that set in Kansas City, people ain't heard it in San Francisco. People ain't heard it in Miami. They ain't heard it in Detroit, Chicago, Atlanta, so forth and so on. Now you do a set, it's on the internet. Somebody heard it. So you can't do a set and make it, make it last three months, four months. Well, it, it doesn't allow the regular comic the ability to grow is the real problem. Like part of comedy is me taking these jokes in January and by March, I've begun to craft this joke. Okay. It's not as simple as it was when I wrote it. It was just da 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 da. But now it has the complexities of the fact that I'm having to deliver this to an East Coast audience, a down South audience, a Midwest audience, a Utah audience, a Colorado audience. And so it begins to take on a different complexion because you're having to deliver it to different people. Okay. And so this is what sharpens your joke. You then take those sharpened jokes and make a special, not you just randomly take some. Mm -hmm. So it's a process. You don't allow them the process if the first time the guy did the joke, now that's his joke and the joke is everywhere. That just sets it up for people to steal. So how many times must you tell a joke before you master it? Great content needs a great audience. That was really insightful what you saw about there. It really tells you about the type of things that comedians have to how many go through and times have you had to sleep with a woman before you're done with her? <laughs> That's not fair. If it's great, never. <laughs> if, if, it, if it ceases to have usefulness, so it has been spoken. Right. I, was, I read that you was raised in, in, in Florida. You had some, some help, some ladies of the night. No, no, no. That's not true. No, that whole story doesn't take place in Florida. That story takes place in Oklahoma City. Okay. So after I'm in Florida, I then join, um, I try to join the Marine Corps and they won't accept me because I'm, right, I'm, too, I'm, I'm too young and I've lied and told them I'm 16 and my family's moving down and I don't have my ID, but it's coming. And so they let me go to the boot camp. Da, da, da. That's not going to work now. Okay. So I've learned that lesson. So then I get this job selling stuff door to door. Um, across the country. And so I've been to all 50 states. Again, I'm 13, 14 years old. Um, so I did that. At, while I'm doing that, one of the places I'm at, I'm in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And I've decided I'm going to stay here because of meeting these ladies that you're talking about mm -hmm. and that situation. I don't know at the time why that's important in my life or why it's something I should be doing or any of that. But now later on, it certainly helps me in formulating Money Mike for Friday After Next right. and a pimp named Slickback uh, for the Boondocks. San Francisco, Oklahoma, so San Francisco, Oklahoma, Sacramento. From Florida, you moved to the West Coast. After, so you're traveling. When did you set up shop on the West Coast? All How right. old were you there? So I, I guess I'm... Uh, 18 or younger, and I, um, once I have my, once I have a child, I realize that um, I can't, it's a lot of things that I could use to make money that now is a no-go. So anything with street aspirations that I might have thought about pursuing or being good at, um, I now am a single parent and I gotta redo this thing. So I need comedy to really work out for me right. and me and God go into um, extreme conversation where I'm explaining to him that I'm a crash out dummy if he don't send me a lifeline, like I need something I can hold on to. Before I left Florida, I did stand up one time because we was trying to get in the club, I didn't have ID. So I said I was a comedian. They ended up having me do five minutes. But I kept that in my head that I had done that. When we get to Oklahoma, they're having a competition for stand-up, and if you win, you get to go out on the road with uh, Jeff Foxworthy and Dan Whitney, who is Larry the Cable Guy, and Richard Jenny, and these great comics, you get to open for them. And once I did that, 
I realized, okay, as a comedian, I'm like way behind schedule. I done started this too late. All the funny guys are already funny and known names. Like, how am I going to progress? So I realized that I, I, I do better with a white audience than I do with a black audience. And I, I'm not sure why that's occurring, okay. but the white audience likes me more. That's, that's interesting. So when I moved to Sacramento, it's because Sacramento has a white and a black audience almost 50-50. That's okay. almost the makeup of Sacramento. So I live in Sacramento for two years until I get to the point where I am equally as funny if the room is black as I am if the room is white. Okay. That's not enough. Now I need to be one of the good ones when it comes to black comics mm -hmm. so now I have to move to Oakland and that's what lands me in Oakland for three years once I have dominated uh, male black comedy in Oakland to my liking now I'm prepared to go to Los Angeles now now I know you can't throw me any curveballs if it's a white audience if it's a black audience no matter what they are I'm prepared to deal with all of the audiences do so you write jokes according to the audience that you're gonna be in front of or, yes. uh, or is your joke universal well, in, in the beginning, I part of my framework is that I'm tailoring every show to this audience. Okay. And that's how I was able to show my range and show that I was better than my competitors, is that I'm Cat Williams, but I was still doing clean comedy. So I was still going to churches and doing 45 minutes of stand up at the church with no curse words, no sex, drug material, no none of that, just straight stand up. And then I was doing everything else. And I at the regular club. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the range is that where when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So um that's how I started. Um, but as you begin to get better, you begin to be able to speak to your entire fan base. And that's really what's been helpful is that I've been having the same conversation with my fan base for 12 comedy specials. Is that so. what set Cat Williams apart? Is your range? Is that you can do a comedy, do 45 minutes in the church. I can go to a comedy club in front of 250 or I can go into an arena with 15,000. Um, that's range because everybody can't do that cat well if that's what range is called then 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 yeah it's range but i i like the people i'm talking to mm -hmm. you see what i'm saying so it's not it's not like um it can't be condescending because i'm talking to my white male friend when i'm telling that white joke right when i'm talking about this joke about this black lady i know that black lady that's who i'm talking to i'm 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 speaking to this fan base that I've been speaking to from the beginning. I already told them what I was on when I first came in. I told them they was going to come after me. They was going to cancel me. They was going to say terrible things about me and try to mess my life up. I, I said that coming into stand up. I'm, I'm saying it in my So you knew it was going to be? It has to be. I know I'm going into the belly of the beast. How could I be naive? I know that I'm going into Satan's playground, but I'm trying to be so good that you got to bring me in so close that I can see who's doing what and what's going on in there. In San Francisco, you joined the nation. I was ever in San Francisco. I was in Oakland. You were in Oakland. Did you join the nation? Is that? Yeah, Minister, Honorable Minister Farrakhan and I have um, an extremely close relationship. He, he refers to me um, as one of his sons. So, um, yeah, I, I spent a particular period of time. Let me explain. Yes. Because my particular background was already religious mm -hmm. and super strict, right? I didn't find out about other religions by reading about them. I went to their religion. I, I, I don't want to learn from Jewish people from outside. I want to be in the synagogue. I, wanna, I, I don't want to learn about Muslim people from I, I want to be in a mosque. I, I, I don't want to hear about the You should have went to a real mosque. I went to a real one. The Baptist or the Pentecostal. I want to go to their church okay. and see. And so that was the religious discovery that I was on through that period in my life. When did you know you were funny? Mm, probably. Is he done insulting people? Um, about ten years ago. Like, ten years ago. Yeah, about ten years. Ago. So you didn't think. So you didn't think as a child. That's that's my point. Uh, we're gonna look at reactions to this. Oh. I, took, I took all the vicious and you venom away because it? I didn't have any. Plus, I understood I'm not trying to offend black women with short hair, I'm not trying to offend heavyset women. 
I'm not trying to upset fellow comedians. I'm not trying to do any of that. And I can't, I am qualified to be able to do none of that and still eviscerate you because I'm smart enough to know that I need to say that you have gnarled fingers because I know your limited education means you don't know what the word means. So you can't possibly respond to it. You're not sure of the meaning. And I'm going to continue hitting you because this is what comedians do. Right. You've been masquerading that you're a comedian too. And that's the fallacy. So and nobody that, in boxing fights out of their weight class. If you're a 130 pounder, you don't just show up with the 160 pounders. You stay in your weight class. Is that what you wanted to do? No. That she was out of her. We've she never been something. embarrassed of Jada Pinkett Smith. She always worked hard for every role. She didn't get made by Will Smith. <laughs> Regardless of what you think about her relationship, that's not your relationship. If it's an open relationship, understand that means him and men, not. You think about it wrong. It's okay. These things matter. <laughs> <laughs> you giving the inside inside because because Hollywood know that. I love for you talking about Jada, how people have tried to vilify her, especially after her quote unquote entanglement. I think it's so disrespectful. Go on. No, there is a business where they fiddle with the perception of the people. And that's part of the job. Back in the day, it used to be called propaganda. Now it's just called business. They don't say we got to smear the candidate. They smear them. As soon as you breach that, they done with you too. They have decided that they were finished with Will. That's the same nobody that shot Tupac. We've never been embarrassed of Jada Pinkett Smith. She always worked hard for it. It's interesting that he took Jada Jada Smith, you know. Um... Kevin Hart responds, but then it shows, I don't know. Okay, so. Cat Williams pulled up, uh, never wanted to bite his tongue. Williams had smoke for a plethora of other black comedians, including Kevin Hart, Ricky Smiley, Michael Blackson, Steve Harvey, and Cedric, the entertainer. Thing. Cedric told you when you asked him, did you steal Cat Williams' joke? Yeah. He said, it don't line up. How it don't line up that I did it on TV in 2018? You came to see me at the Comedy Store do it in 2019 and then did it on the Kings of Comedy. Like, what doesn't line up? I, this is a televised joke that Mark Curry helped me punch up and get to the level that it was. The same Steve that went to go watch Mark Curry do his whole sitcom and then stole everything Mark Curry had. Now Steve got a sitcom where he the principal and he wear a suit and he... And then he gets this high top fade, making all black men think he got the best lineup in the business. And it's a man unit. <laughs> <laughs> then you ask him, why you not a movie star? I didn't want to be a movie star. This the same Negro that hated on Bernie with this same thing. I didn't want to be a movie star. No, you couldn't be a movie star. There are 30,000 new scripts in Hollywood every year. Not one of them. All right, we heard this part. 12 times. <laughs> and that bitch right in front of him, <laughs> knocking them bitches out the park. Yeah, else, I, right? I, I, Every movie that we done seen has been copied or, you know, we took something from it and then redid it a little bit better, right? You can't be mad that. But I think the lie to say that you didn't is where it, that's the problem. Yeah. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. So that's like sampling somebody's music and not asking them. Mm -hmm. Right? Giving them no credit. Yeah, you give them no credit. Jesus is boring. What are we gonna do? Yo, you think Harvey Weinstein tried to Cat Williams for him to be in a movie? That was wild. Oh, I mean, there's how if I'm hard, like, wouldn't you be getting your suck this? Not like, yo, I'll let you be in my movie if I can suck your It's crazy. You a different kind of animal. Yo, that's <laughs> crazy, right? You a different kind of animal if you want to suck put somebody in the movie. That, maybe he just misspoke. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he misspoke. Maybe that's not what he meant, but. You a wild boy. Yeah, you gotta you love sucking suck dick. dick. Hey man, I wanna put you in this movie, but I need to suck your dick first. Maybe though. Come on, uh, maybe. Oh, you just, I can see. I, I would think that how you would, you gotta suck my dick. No, I gotta suck, you know. But hey, yeah. you can see what whatever you want. Like, I think there are male actors who also had to go through what Harvey put people through to get some roles, Duh. and none of them have come out about it. Yeah, but all we've heard about Harvey is just girls, women that he's done that for roles. He's saying that the men are too embarrassed to admit that they got their dick sucked to be in a movie. Duh. And by the way, don't get it fucked up. Yeah, both of y'all are absolutely right. But 
There's powerful women in the business who do that shit too. There's powerful women in the business who take advantage of, you know, their positions and Hell who they yeah. are. And they making these motherfuckers, you know, do something strange for a little bit of change too. Don't get it fucked up. But what if we found out one of those powerful women was like, yo, if I can suck your dick, I'll put you in my movie. I can see that though. But how would we feel you can about see it? it? Yeah, how would you feel if a woman came up to you and was like, you want to get this? Let me suck your dick. Would you let them suck it? I don't know. I don't see how you losing that. I understand you being forced and that's not good, but I, I got up and I get pay, a paycheck and I get a big role in this movie. Yo, sign me up. Sign me up. Yeah. How would we feel about it? Yeah. Movie, please. What movie? <laughs> Blue Beetle. <laughs> Blue Beetle. Yeah. Blue Beetle. Yeah. Our boy Jolo. It's, weird. it's it's strange, right? Because like, if, if a person, if a woman comes to you and a woman says, yo, I'll put you in this movie if you let me suck your dick. What if she reverses it? So what? Try the same thing. But okay, say it me. What do you mean? What's reverse? You go. Huh? So you go, you'll, I'll suck your dick if I... No, I don't like how that's going to look on camera. They might edit that shit and... <laughs> Have you leaning over you be like, hey, shout <laughs> you know what I mean? So what are you saying? Oh, you go, that's what bothers you, not you bending over before. <laughs> All the memes they gonna put. <laughs> Anybody make memes. Uh, <laughs> I, they, I'll suck you, yo, let me suck your dick and I'll put you in my movie. Okay, and so. Wow. So what, what, what a is woman is going, let me suck your dick, I'll put you there. This is how that's gonna go. But see, that's a, that's a question, right? Let me suck your dick. Yes. And I'll put you in this movie. Oh, awesome. So if I let you suck my dick, yeah. that's consent. That's what I'm saying. It's yes immediately. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you found out you're also going to be in a movie and you're like, this is great. I thought I was just coming here to audition. I didn't realize I was going to get my dick sucked. <laughs> now I'm also going to be in the movie. Like, this is the best case scenario ever. Yeah. I no, mean, no, it's I'm interesting. Thinking. I mean, I saw what Cat Williams said. It's just like, I mean, I can't. I... But, but like you said, if you agree, then I'll be consent. What if, like, if you don't let me suck your dick and cast you into this movie, you will never work in town again? I don't know. <laughs> I guess, you know, I guess it depends on how attractive you are. And how, especially if you know you're going to get casted, you're getting, it's going to help your career, and you're going to experience a blowjob, and all these quotes, I don't know, it sounds like just a win, if it's the other way around. But if it's a, a guy doing it to a girl, that seems so fun. Up. Like it really sells evil, or if a guy is doing that to a guy, I don't know. I guess it depends on the woman too, you know. You know, I like I'm saying this like I'm joking and all that, but I, I've never been in a situation like that in a serious manner. So you know, never, 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 no. who am I to dismiss what Cat Williams said? That's but he's also a genius because now I can't wait to go see him on tour because I'm like, please talk about all this shit that you talked about in this movie, in this interview. I feel like Cat has talked about this before though. About the Harvey Weinstein thing. I feel like he, because that's what he was explaining in the interview. He was like, yo, I got, in, I got blackballed. I got in trouble for talking about Harvey before all of this shit came out. And he said that in his standup? I don't know if it was in his standup, but I feel like he said that, uh, he said that somewhere before. Salute to Shannon Sharp though. Club Shay Shay be cooking. He is cooking, man. Club Shay Shay be fucking cooking. That kind of power and you got that kind of money, you you probably say shit like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I don't, you know, I just I, I I still don't know why he would want to suck a dick. That's the crazy thing to me. Yeah, if you're the person with the power and you have the ability to Word. change somebody's word, like wouldn't you say you suck my dick rather than I will? Suck? You know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't know. That feels weird. Situation? Why would you be sucking the dick? Yeah, yeah. That's what makes it even wilder. But maybe you're a comedian. Cat's a comedian. So that's a better bit. It is a way better <laughs> that's bit. That's a better bit. It is a you better bit. You know what I'm saying? Like, if he was to say, Harvey asked me to do X, Y, and Z, nah, he says we I, expect that. He says something funny afterwards. He said, I, hell no, I didn't do that shit. Now I got to the table read, and there were two other black dudes there, and I was like, Hi, yeah, well, how the fuck y'all get into this movie? <laughs> 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 so he could just be it, doing a bit. It's funny. It, it's hilarious. It's funny. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny, man. It's funny. What else we got, Taylor? Yo, why he Taylor 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 on, like, on the couch just so relaxed and so, like, Stretched out like it'd be looking funny. Hey, Tay Tay. I, I saw Cat say something too about Kevin Hart, and he said Kevin Hart's um, Kevin Hart's come up wasn't organic. I totally disagree with that. I totally disagree with that. And the reason I disagree with that is because we watched Kev 
not succeed in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. We watched his NBC sitcom. I think it was NBC. We watched his sitcom not succeed in Hollywood. We watched Soul Plane not do well. Also, stand-up is like as organic as it gets. Like Kevin was selling out these shows. He was selling out clubs, arenas. Like people have to leave their house and then go see you. There's nothing, the in, like the industry can keep putting somebody in a movie that we don't like. Yeah. And eventually it's just like they gave this person opportunities that none of us give a fuck about, but they like them, so they're going to do it. And maybe that's what happened with Kevin initially. But with stand-up, Nobody can force people to go see your show. That's right. They either like you or they don't like you. So yeah, I don't know. Play, 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 play the clip, Taylor. Play the clip. Scroll up, scroll, scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. Go to Coach Millennial, scroll up, Taylor. Right. Yeah, play that one, that one, that one. Hollywood has a memory of going to a sold Start out Kevin Hart show. There being a line. In 15 years in Hollywood, no one in Hollywood has a memory of going to a sold out Kevin Hart show. I there do. There being a line for him ever getting a standing ovation at any well, comedy club. He already had his deals when he got here. Have we heard of a comedian that came to L.A. and in his first year in L.A. he had his own sitcom on network television and had his own movie called Soul Plane that he was leading? No, we've never heard of that before that person or since that person. What do you think a plant is? Maybe people don't understand the definitions of these words. He just did his documentary with Chris Rock where he shows you that his whole upbringing in comedy was on the East Coast. Yeah, it was. So how simultaneously was he here in Los Angeles doing the same thing? It didn't happen. It didn't happen. And I, I, I hate to seem like a petty individual for picking apart lies, but Jesse Smollett gonna keep lying until you say we don't believe. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know about the early out. L.A. shit, but we watch Kev yeah. sitcom not be successful. We watch Kev's Soul Plane not do well. And then Kev hit that stand-up circuit. Hmm. And Kev was in those comedy clubs. And, hmm. Kev, and, and, and I can tell y'all things that I saw firsthand. Kev would have his team walk around the comedy clubs and collect everybody's email. And he would collect these emails all across the country. And he started sending out a newsletter. Kev would send out a newsletter every, every, every week telling you where he's going to be. By the time all of these social media platforms hit, I remember when Twitter first came out. And we all was like, how the fuck Kev get all of these followers? Because he already had this database of people right. because of his newsletter. Yeah. I remember when Kev sold out and I've told this story a million times. It's in Kev's book, too. Kev sold out Caroline's Comedy Club 12 times in a weekend. Like, he did some unprecedented shit. Where he had, like, shows on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Like, three shows a night or four shows a night. Some cra it was some crazy, unprecedented number. Kept adding shows. Sold out, packed, lined down the fucking block. And just, I, we, we, we backstage, Kev and Duvall going at it like they always do. Like, just stage. Right. You see them on this? Yeah. You see them on that? You see them on that? From Philadelphia, Kevin Hart. Crowd loses it. Kev walks off. What does Gary turns back to the ball, winks. <laughs> Gary goes on stage. I saw that. Gary Owens re responds to this thing. We've got a large mushroom pizza. Susan Marie. Pizza again. Hey, Palmer. Hello, friend. If you haven't seen it, you've been living under a rock. But Cat Williams went on Shannon Sharp's podcast, Club Shay Shay, and nobody was safe, brother. Nobody. Here's my thing. Cat talked about, said he's the entertainer. He talked about D.L. Hughley, and good and bad. I'm not just saying this isn't all bad. He talked about Mark Curry, Steve Harvey, Ricky Smiley. My name came up. Uh, Tiffany Haddish, Wanda Smith. Uh, let me think. Am I forgetting? Let me see. He started off. The thing is, he comes in, guns are blazing. It's not even like a feeling out portion of the show. Cat just came in and me went in on Ricky. It all started with Friday. And as I'm watching it, and here's the thing, here's the thing about Cat. We all got opinions on comedians. And Cat doesn't hold his opinion back. I do. I, I, I'll be honest with you. There's some comedians I find funny. Some I find hacky. I just don't, I don't feel the need to air it to the to the masses. I'll, I'll keep that to myself because I like to be Switzerland in all this. I like to be, I, I, Kevin Hart got it with, I remember when Chris Brown and uh, Drake had the beef, right? Later on they came together, did a music, they did a song, did a music video together and I remember Kevin was cool with both. Kevin was cool with Chris and he was cool with Drake, like really cool with both and I was thinking, hmm, how's Kevin going to navigate this? Because some people, man, when, when you got beef, they're like either you're with me or against me. And I'm more Switzerland. I, I tend to try to get along with everybody. You never know when work's going to come your way. Somebody might have a project they're thinking of you. So I kind of keep, if I have anything negative, just out and out negative for no reason, unsolicited, I tend to keep it to myself. Now, if you, if you talk shit about me or the Monique situation years ago when she compared Will Packer to Harvey Weinstein, I spoke up on that because Will's my friend. He's put me in three movies. 
produce one of my comedy specials, and I was just like, you know, I don't know your beef with Tyler. I don't know your beef with with uh, Oprah. That has nothing to do with me. But you spoke on my friend. You compared him to, you know, a sexual predator, and I didn't like it. So I just. He's going to give you his answer unfiltered, unsolicited. Uh, and, it, and it, you know, you could get mad about it or you'd be like, that's really how he feels. But regardless whether you agree or you disagree with what Kat is saying on Shannon Tart's podcast, you're watching. It's getting everybody's attention because people are commenting on it. He went in on Faison. Who's my boy? I love Faison. But then Faison started making posts on Instagram that I'm laughing at. So to say, at the same time, I'm looking at Kat going, oh, I'm looking at Faison going, oh, now if I see Kat. I'm still going to be cool with Cat. Cat's always been cool with me. He's done some cool things for me in my life. Faison. Still going to be cool with Faison. That's my boy. And even then, I could I could talk to Cat about Faison and not have to go in on Faison. I could talk to Faison about Cat and not feel like I have to, to you know, piggyback it and, and go in on Cat. I, you know, I, I just sit and listen and laugh at it all. Because if you're a comedian and you're a true stand-up comedian, we're offense-proof. We, we cannot be offended by anything. We, we, we can catch strays. We can catch arrows like everybody else. And we always say, like, just be honest. Don't say something behind my back. Whether you like Cat or not, he's not going to talk behind your back. However he feels about you, that's how he feels about you. Now, he did say one thing. Um, he talked about Ricky Smiley, and he talked about when Ricky Smiley went on Club Shay Shay, Shannon Sharp's podcast, which is a great podcast, especially for, I know I'm a white guy, but for my demographics, and I'll get into that in a minute, what Cat said about me, but for my demographics, you know, Club Shay Shay. I'd rather go on Club Shay Shay than Joe Rogan. Um, even though, okay, I, I got to get into. All, I got to unpack this, this this podcast because Cat made a comment where he said, uh, "Why you think Gary Owen, who's a white guy, has been doing stand up for twenty five years, hasn't crossed over?" And when he said it, I was like, "Wait a minute, was that a good thing or bad thing?" And I literally had to go to Twitter and start asking people, "Was I catching strays or what was that?" And they was like, "No, they were saying you haven't sold your soul." That's why you haven't crossed over. You've been consistently you, and that's why you haven't, quote, unquote, crossed over. So I was like, oh, okay, that made sense. Now, I'm not going to get into it, but I've been uh, – I, I was in an awkward situation one time where I can't say for 100% this person was trying to make me do something, casting couch type deal, but it felt like it. And I was like, is this, is this, is this that point where I've always heard, well, you suck a dick for a million dollars? And I was thinking to myself when I was in this office going, in this room going, well, this is the, I'm, I'm about to answer this question. And the answer was no, I wouldn't. So, <laughs> now I, 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 listen, I can't say for 100%. That's where it was going, but it felt like it. It felt like it. You got to be in the room to feel it. And I was like, oh, this dude is really coming on to me. Like, this is happening in real life. It, and the, 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 the dude did it and it always remained nameless. Uh, he, I think he was feeling me out. Like, is this, this dude? And this is years ago. I was young in the game. But I, I was just like, wait a minute. Is this happening right now? I was like, oh, my God. And then I was like, I, I, you know, I made sure. I made it very clear. I like women. I'm not going that route. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not going to get into it. But I, I was wondering. I was like, oh, is this, gonna, is, this, is this happening to me right now in real life? So I think Kat was saying I haven't sold my soul. Yeah, apparently you didn't sell your soul, dude. Apparently you didn't sell yourself. I'm out, guys. <laughs>